Okay, we're going to start with the imaging strategy, what we call a protocol. So I'm going to start by having you uh, answer the question. These are, these are the basic kinds of images, the sequences that we use. And identify the six images. What, what, what is the, the pulse sequence? And those, um, those categories aren't necessarily all used. Some of them might be used once or twice or more. Good. All right. So, in, in radiology, we call this orbit MRI. That's because radiologists are ignorant as to the subtleties of your specialty. We don't know about oculoplastics and their ophthalmology quite so much. But when we say orbit, what we mean is it's basically eyes, orbit, skull base, midbrain, the portions of the brain and skull that are involved with, with vision and ocular motor and and the related neurological um, findings. So when we say orbit MRI, we, we kind of need a, a, a grab bag of those things. Now, the core sequences that you can use in uh, this, and actually any head and neck you can do, when we say head and neck, we mean stuff that's not brain. Um, and any part of the head and neck, including the orbit, is an axial and coronal thin section, and you do a T2 fat sat, or a STIR, a T1 pre, and a T1 post contrast fat sat. And we call this the, uh, uh, the six-pack, and I'll show that in just a second. So in addition to those six, we do a, an ultra-thin T2, which is just looking at the cisterns, the nerves, and the arteries uh, in, the, uh, in the cisterns. We use a diffusion of the brain. There is some diffusion use in the orbit and, and head and neck. And then whatever whole brain and angiographic imaging might be appropriate. So um, this is a... These two, these are, this is basically a, a pair, uh, three pairs of sequences that we call the head and neck six pack. And this can cover pretty much any part of the skull, and it uh, just depends on where you're, where you're going to cover and how, how thin the sequences are going to be. The two on the left, this is actual and coronal. These are the T2, because the vitreous is bright, CSF is bright. Um, the fat is uh, dark, so it's either going to be a T2 stir. Uh, I'm sorry, it's either going to be a T2 fat set or a STIR. Both of those accomplish the same thing. In the middle, these are T1 pre's. Um, CSF is dark, vitreous is dark, fat is bright. We don't fat suppress pre-contrast generally uh, because you want to have the contrast of the fat to show you what, what things are. Uh, and by contrast, I mean the visual contrast. And then on the right, these are post-gadolinium T1s, axial and coronal. The fat is dark, so the fat has been suppressed. This is our basic um, six sequences you can pretty much cover any part of the head and neck with. Um, in addition, we do these, uh, these heavily T2 weighted, very CSF bright sequences that emphasize a, a structure that are in the cisterns. This is not really great for looking at parenchyma. Um, it's just really a, a, a fluid um, sensitive sequence. Uh, and then we throw in whatever vascular imaging is appropriate. Now, for the most part, we've gone to CTA for most of our neurological probably ophthalmological evaluations because it's got better spatial resolution. Um, and also you don't have the temporal issues with a patient sitting down and, and 
in a magnet and moving for, for five minutes because you get a lot of motion with those. Um, but MRA does have its role. You can do time of flight in the head, um, dynamic contrast imaging in the neck. And with MRA, the one thing you can get and you don't get with CT is these thrombus sensitive techniques to look for things like um, internal hematoma or a dissection. So this is a, a typical post-contrast um, dynamic neck, and then this is one of those T2, one of the, I'm sorry, one of these uh, thrombus sensitive T1 weighted sequences that shows you uh, little bits of dissection as subintimal hematoma. That's not contrast. This is a non-contrast, this is probably the one time that we use fat suppression with T1. Blood is bright on T1, and um, when you're trying to look for small areas of dissection, you want to use a little bit of blood in the wall of the vessel. We use a T1 and we fat suppress that so that the fat signal goes away. And all you see, and we don't have contrast, so all you see is anything that is intrinsically bright on T1. That includes things like blood, melanin, certain types of calcification. Um, and if you fat suppress, then pretty much what you're left behind is what's bright is maybe something that's flowing. Um, flow can have some intrinsic T1 signal without contrast, without gadolinium, and then uh, blood products that are subacute will be often pretty bright. And so the, the six sequences are these two on the left, one of them is a stir, the other one is a T2 fat set. And this one is a stir, it's got a little less space resolution, this is a T2 fat set, but they both achieve the same purpose. Lesions are bright and um, fat and other things are, are, are darker. This middle one, these are the T1 spin echo non-contrast non enhanced and this is our, our sequence that shows basically the anatomy really well. You want the fat signal for the most part, so we don't usually fat suppress these. And then the, on the right, we have the, t, the axial and coronal T1 post contrast with fat suppression. And these uh, show enhancing lesions very brightly. Of course, things like um, the extraocular muscles, the mucosa vessels will also enhance. <coughs> Pathology that is past the blood brain barrier or the um, uh, uh, tumors or inflammation will enhance. And in this case, you want the fat to go dark because it gets in the way of seeing what's enhancing. So this is a T1 post-contrast fat sat axial corona. Okay, uh, skull base anatomy. So I'm going to show you a series of sequences, a series of, of uh, CT images, and there are six things to identify. And not, not all visible on each one, so I'll show you one, one at a time. Um, starting with the coronal, these five foramina. Match them up on your sheet. And then after this, um, I'll show you some axial images with the same numbers. So it give you a, a kind of a confirmation or a contradiction, depending on if you're right or wrong. Let's see if that helps a little bit. And number six is only on only on one of the images. And there's one answer that, that is probably a little imprecise, but that's okay. This isn't, a, this isn't a standardized test. And actually, some of the best questions that you learn from the most are questions that have a little bit of imprecision to them, because then you have to understand the subtleties, and um, it gives us a chance to discuss. Anybody want to go back to the other one? All good? Okay. So, uh, when addressing the skull base, it helps to divide it into these four big chunks. The anterior, which is basically, number one. The central, 
which is the complex stuff with a lot of frame. That's, that's most of what we're talking about here is um, uh, the central skull base. The T-bone, which is actually just another part of the skull base that has to do with uh, cranial nerve 7 and 8 and the carotid and the posterior skull base 9 through 12. And the central is really what we're talking about um, with a neurop, though, in orbit. Uh, we can look at the list of frama, and again, uh, these three, the optic canal, orbital fissures, and rotundum, are probably where most of the action is with regard to the cranial nerves and skull base foramina. Um, from below, we're looking at three, four, five, the big chunk here, and six, optic nerve ab above, in uh, close approximation to the infundibulum. Looking from the skull base above, two, three, four, and six, and five. And on axial CT, this row along the top, going from superior to inferior, this is the optic canal. Notice how they're coming together to make an X. Right below and lateral to that is the superior fissure, and then a little further down, superior fissure there. Now, I don't really make a distinction much between superior fissure and inferior fissure, because they're the same structure. They're, they're all connected. It's just, what level are you at? So it's not really possible to say on imaging where the superior starts and the inferior, uh, inferior stops because it's just it's, it's a gash right there in the in the back of the, of the of the orbital apex. The inferior is more in line with V2 and rotundum, so it's a little bit lower. But for purpose of imaging, it's just it's that it's that open slot in the back of the orbit. And the 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 biggest thing to remember is that the optic the optic canals are close together and they're angling toward each other, and the and the fissure is kind of pointing straight back here and here. So that's not optic canal, that is optic canal. A little further down, you have foramen rotundum, which leads into this little space here that is the pterygopalatine fossa. And we call that the crossroads of the deep face because there's all kinds <coughs> of interconnections uh, right there between the oral cavity, uh, the nasal cavity, the masticator space, orbit, intracranial. And um, from a coronal in front going further back. Uh, this is the optic uh, This is the optic strut right there, that little piece of bone that connects the, the uh, clinic process to the central sphenoid. Above that and medially is the optic canal here and here, optic canal here and here. The fissure is right below it. So notice how as you're coming into the very back of the orbital apex, the optic canal and the superior and inferior orbital fissure are all this kind of open space right there. As you go further back, the optic canal separates out, goes medial. Here you have what's left of the fissure. Going a little further back, um, the inferior portion of the fissure turns into foramen rotundum right there. Below and medial to that is the vidian canal. So this is foramen rotundum, vidian, interclinated process. And now the optic nerves are starting to come together. A little further back, they're going to um, join into the chiasm. And, a little, and then even further back, we have the vidian canal here. And that is now turning into Meckel's cave as the rotundum goes goes back uh, into, this, into the uh, intracranial compartment. We don't really see um, foramen ovale much, and ovale is more of an of an ENT thing. It doesn't really enter much into what what uh, you do. But here it is, right there. The foramen ovale is this little uh, foramen right there. And if we were to go even a couple of slices further back, you'd see foramen ovale as a whole right here and right there. So it's pretty distinctive when you see it, but. Um, it's a little further back from what we're, what we're dealing with here. Okay, so this was optic canal here and here, here and here. This is superior fissure. If you wanted to call either one of these inferior fissure, I think it's fine um, because, again, they're, they're more or less the same structure. This is um, rotundum here, vidian, rotundum. As you come forward from these foramina into this open space right there, this is the pterygopalatine fossa. Um, I didn't really label this one, but this is the, the sitting palatine canal. The pterygopalatine fossa has a connection into the oral cavity through this palatine canal right there. So optic nerves, fissure, fissure, rotundum, pterygopalatine fossa here and here, midian canal, and ovale. OK. Um, Identify these cranial nerves. 
Okay, got them all? <coughs> okay. We'll start with uh, vision and, and sacrocranial nerve. Um, we follow from uh, obviously the, the retina and globe, intraorbital segment, optic canal, intracanalicular through the cisternal chiasm and track and then back into the into the intraparenchymal pathways. So we don't aren't going to talk a whole lot about the intraorbital um, nerve. Uh, but it's important to recognize uh, what it looks like on imaging. Because the, uh, the optic canals are at an angle, they're not going to show up as round dots. They're going to be either ovals, or you might not even see a complete circle around it, because depending on, on, on how the slice is taken. But you'll see it, if it's perfectly aligned, as this ovoid canal here. Again, it's medial and above the optic strut and the uh, clarinet process fissure below. So this is the optic canal. It's easier to see these things on CT, so you kind of get in your mind what it looks like on CT, and then you remember that and project it onto MR. So now that I've shown you the CT and superimposed the MR, it's really easy to see where it is. Here's your optic nerve here and here, but it can be kind of hard to do that um, without a little, a little bit of memory of where these things are. And if you follow this back, here's your optic nerve as they're coming out of the canal, going further back into the cisternal portion of the optic nerve, they're back to um, the chiasm, the level of the infundibulum of the pituitary, further back into the, into the tracks, and lateral cuniculus. In the axial plane, you can see that <coughs> the uh, optic canal, or the optic nerves, if you cut it just right, they actually, you can actually see the X going from um, the nerves to the chiasm to the tracks. Now, in reality, you don't see this view very often, because that's a, a different angle. Um, to see that view, you actually have to take a slice that is quite a bit angled from straight axis. So you, you normally don't see that in the standard imaging. But if you really wanted to kind of lay out the chiasm because you had a particular uh, interest in, in it, you could do this uh, axial at an angle and, and have it show that way. Um, in the, in the mid-sagittal, this is the third ventricle, mass intermedia, anterior commissure. At the front of the third ventricle, are these two little recesses this recess is right above the optic chiasm. That's the chiasmatic recess, and right behind it is another little recess. It's the infundibular recess as it's going into the pituitary. So on a sagittal T2, you can see these things. This is the third ventricle. Rookie mistake, this is not the third ventricle. That's the between the lateral ventricles, the third ventricle. And I think it kind of looks like the head of a bird, like, like a water bird, a, a loon. This is the eye of the bird, and this is the beak. And this part of the beak, that's the chiasmatic recess. There's the chiasm, infundibular recess. There's the infundibulum of the pituitary. Um, and you're pretty familiar, obviously, with the, uh, with the pathways and their, their um, geometry. Uh, moving on to the, um, the motor nerves, we follow them from the central nuclei and neural pathways into the cisternal segments, uh, through the cavernous sinus, the foramen, and the skull base, through the fissure, and then into the orbit. So three paired nuclei, paired nuclei in the midbrain. They exit at the intraparenchymal cistern. They dip down and go under this portion of the posterior cerebral artery. From the side, you can see the, the nucleus. It comes, exits the intraparenchymal cistern, comes down, comes underneath this portion of the posterior cerebral right above the superior cerebellar artery into the cavernous sinus through the fissure and into the orbit. On imaging, you can see these nerves as they're coming out of the cistern. Again, because they're dipping down, they're not going to show up as a line. You're going to, just going to see them as they course through the plane. So the two nerves coming out, as you go a little bit further down, you see them here. The other one we don't see quite as well, coursing through the cistern. And then when you get, as it's going into the cavernous sinus, there's a little sleeve of CSF right around the nerve here and here. That's the oculomotor cistern. It's the way you can identify it as it's coming forward into the cavernous sinus. In a coronal plane, um, here is that nerve. Remember, it comes down and loops under the posterior cerebrals. This is the basilar artery, anterior inferior cerebellar, superior cerebellar arteries. Here's the P1 segments of the PCAs. And the, the third nerve comes right between that it's sort of caught between these two arteries, which is why that can be a place where you can get into trouble. And if you come forward, this is again in the coronal plane, remember we said there's a little sleeve of CSF around it. This is that oculomotor cistern, 
right around the third nerve as it's about to enter into the cavernous sinus. <coughs> and this is to remind us of that relationship between the nerve, third nerve, this carotid, PCOM, and the PCAs, and how it's between the PCA and the SCA here coming off the basal nerve. Fourth nerve, um, they're a little bit lower in the, in the dorsal midbrain. They exit around the back, come around in the perimesencephalic cistern on both sides. They also course right lateral to the thirds in between those two arteries. So underneath the PCA and above the superior cerebellar coming forward. So very close to, but just lateral um, to the th um, third nerve. So from the lateral, we see it exiting around the back in the perimesencephalic cistern. It's a small nerve, has a long course, which is why we think of it as being um, sort of susceptible and exposed to, to injury. Um, coming between the two arteries into the cavernous sinus, through the fissure, and into the orbit. Uh, it's a very small nerve, so you don't always see it, but on these really thin KISS images, you can sometimes see it exiting around the back. It's hard to see it in the perimesencephalic cistern. There's a lot of other stuff in there, too. There's the basal, the basal veins of Rosenthal and the PCAs and uh, branches. And so it, there's a lot going on in this perimesencephalic cistern, so it might be hard to actually track the fourth all the way since it is such a small structure. And if you follow it closely, you can sometimes see it in this space between the, the, the PCA and the SCA, uh, but that can be um, uh, difficult to see every single time because it's a small structure. Fifth nerve, um, pre, the preganglionic segment, the ganglion sitting in Meckles Cave, and then the three branches. V1 is the one that most often uh, shows up in, in the neurofa and, and orbit, but the V2 also coming straight forward uh, here in the frame rotundum through the inferior fissure into the orbit, and then uh, V3, which you don't deal with very much, coming straight down through frame room valley. And this would be a coronal slice in this uh, location would show you that, that the V3 frame room valley going straight down. It's a really easy nerve to see. It's a big, fat one, and you almost always can see it, even on, on routine uh, brain imaging, um, coming right out of the, the lateral pons, straight forward, and it goes into Meckles Cave, which is going to be a little pocket of CSF, and you'll often see the fibers, which look kind of a trunk behind, as they go into Meckles Cave, the fibers will often sort of um, separate out. You can see like little individual fibers coming into uh, the ganglion right here uh, in Meckles Cave. Uh, the sixth nerve with its uh, nuclei posterior in the lower uh, midbrain, and the nerves come straight forward. They, they exit out underneath the pons um, and ascend into the prepontine cistern. So from the side, you can see, so here's the nucleus of six. The, the, the uh, fibers come out, and they exit right underneath the belly of the pons, and then they ascend, kind of following the, this lower contour of the pons, and they go into the, the uh, cavernous sinus through a little, there's a little dural <coughs> reflection there, Durello's canal, uh, that you can sometimes see as a little, a little pocket as the nerve goes, kind of, just kind of skimming right over the edge of the temporal bone right there. Now, it's a really small structure, but because nothing else runs in the same direction, you can usually see it. It's ascending, and so it's not going to show up as a single line throughout its whole course, but there's really only one structure that's coming in this direction, kind of straight forward, maybe angling a little lateral, and that's the sixth nerve. So you can usually see one structure coming up here like this and that, and that's the sixth nerve. From the side, um, again, there aren't, really aren't very many things that are coming out from under the ponds ascending up in that direction, so you can often see it, um, even though it's a fairly small structure. Uh, in the coronal uh, drawing of the cavernous sinus, um, there is a second nerve, third, fourth, V1, V2, and six. Six is sometimes described as being the most exposed to cavernous sinus disease because it's the most kind of floating uh, within um, uh, the center of the, of the sinus, as opposed to <coughs> have a little bit more of a, a, kind, of a kind of a dural um, uh, approximation. So the the, the six nerve of uh, the five nerves here. This is five. This is six. This is two because it's remember if you think about the little bird's beak, that's the chiasmatic recess. There's this, the chiasm. This is three. Okay, let's talk about some pathology visual pathways. First, question one. 
which of the following diagnoses is least likely in this young adult with acute vision loss? And we have a coronal T2 fat suppressed and a coronal T1 post contrast. MS, aquaporin, demyelination, MOG, sarcoid, or Wegener's? Which is least likely? Next question, question two, here we have a post-contrast axial. This one is not fat suppressed, but it is post-contrast. You can see the mucosa and vessels are bright. Um, which of the following is most correct regarding this optic pathway lesion? Most patients with this lesion have NF1. Most patients with NF1 have this lesion. This lesion is associated with mild vision loss. Enhancement indicates higher tumor grade. So which of those is most correct? <clears throat> okay. Um, just, oh, a third question. Um, which of the following is the most likely clinical feature in this, in this, in this lesion? This is an axial CT with no contrast. There's also a, an MR to go with it. Back so to these are the options. Sudden vision loss, painful vision loss, post of main capillary lay spots, middle-aged female, prior radiation therapy. <coughs> okay. All right, so um, differential diagnosis of, of Visual pathways affected by, by tumors in the orbit, skull base and cisterns, um, optic glioma, meningioma. There's other orbital masses, a lot of which uh, we won't have time to talk about. Um, pituitary, because of its close proximity to the optic chiasm, and then metastases of, 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 of a number of varieties. Now, this is an example of an optic pathway glioma. They can have a lot of variability in their signal. They tend to be quite bright on T2, but as you can see here, they can have some heterogeneity. The enhancement can be quite variable. Now, think of a glioma as kind of like an almost like a pilocytic astrocytoma. In a lot of ways, they're, they're, they're the same lesion. Um, of all the central nervous system tumors, um, this is the one that breaks the rule about enhancement. Enhancement of a, of a pilocytic or a, or a glioma does not correlate with malignancy. In fact, you can have a, these can be uh, good grade ones, and they can have quite a bit of enhancement. So, enhancement doesn't tell you about um, about about degree of malignancy. It can involve any part of the pathway all the way back into the lateral geniculus, and you can also have intra, intra parenchymal lesions. They can enhance, they can not enhance, they can be bilateral, as in this case where you have big fat optic nerves, opticism, and tracts. Um, this is an example of an optic, intraorbital optic nerve sheath meningioma, and the classic appearance is what we call tram tract calcification because it's the dural sheath around the nerve, so if you cut it, down the length, you get the calcium on both sides, you get the tram track, and also you get the same picture on post-contrast T, uh, T1 MRI. You show the, the meningioma along its length, and you get tram track enhancement. So this is a classic appearance of an intraorbital um, nerve sheath meningioma. And the other thing on T2 that's been described as a feature of this is you get a little pocket of CSF collected right behind the optic nerve head. Um, due to the mass effect from, uh, from the intraorbital uh, dural tumor, and uh, that's called an optic, a perioptic cyst. Um, this is an example of metastases affecting the visual pathways. This is a post-contrast coronal T1 with fat suppression. Now, what shouldn't be there is all this signal here. This is a T1, which means CSF is supposed to be dark. You're not supposed to have any brightness around the optic nerve. This is a patient with extensive leptomeningeal carcinomatosis, and the, and, the, and the metastatic disease is falling right down the CSF all the way to the orbit down the optic nerves. Uh, macroadenoma, um, it's, a, it's an, a cellar mass. When it has supercellular extension, it can affect the optic pathways. It, it tends to be very uh, 
intensely enhancing a little, depending on what else is going on, you can have some non-enhancing areas. One thing that we pay really close attention to when there's vision loss and the pituitary mass is any evidence of blood, because um, if you have an acute hemorrhage uh, into a pituitary gland you have, and you have sudden enlargement, you can have acute impingement of the optic nerves, and that actually is a neurosurgical um, emergency and needs to be uh, decompressed um, immediately. So that's pituitary apoplexy. So if you see blood and sudden vision loss in a uh, pituitary mass, so like here, this is a non-contrast skin, all this brightness here, that's all blood products. You can imagine how that's pushing up on the optic chiasm. Uh, to us, that is a, a, a neurosurgical or neuro-ophthalmological emergency. Um, inflammatory conditions of the optic nerve, acute optic neuritis, uh, pseudotumor can affect the optic nerve, but it tends to be do more than, than just the nerve. Um, infectious or post-infectious optic neuritis, and then granulomatous disease can affect the optic nerve. So this is a patient with uh, acute, optic, acute optic neuritis. Here we see a, the T2. We, we see enlargement and hyperintensity of the nerve. The CSF around it has been effaced because it's swollen. Post-contrast, T1, you can see that the nerve is, is enlarged and enhancing compared to the normal side. You know, when we, when we see acute optic neuritis and we're thinking about this could be demyelinating disease, um, in addition to um, optic pathway imaging specifically, it's really important, in fact, in some ways it's almost more important to make sure you do the whole CNS axis imaging so you know how much disease uh, that you're dealing with. Uh, here's an example of pseudotumor affecting the optic, optic nerve. Uh, first, we, the, this is a, a, a lesion uh, that we weren't sure what it was. It kind of looked like, like a meningioma, uh, but after some steroids and some time, it went away. So this was actually um, pseudotumor in a, in a perioptic location. Um, ischemia of the optic nerve isn't necessarily always an imaging diagnosis, but there are um, some times when it can be useful, <laughs> anterior and posterior forms. Um, and then brain imaging, sometimes when you're having patients with stroke, can present as visual uh, disturbance depending on where the stroke is. Um, if we think about uh, ischemic optic neuropathy, the anterior form, which is going to be the more common, isn't really an imaging diagnosis, but if you happen to have um, imaging of an acute, um, optic, neuro uh, acute optic neuropathy, um, you can see a little bit of enhancement at the optic nerve head. And that's in distinction to the very rare, thankfully, and very tragic posterior ischemic optic neuropathy, which is the periatesthetic prolonged skull base um, uh, cervical spine uh, anesthesia surgery, um, you can see a striking dramatic diffusion uh, restriction and after a few days you can see some enhancement of the optic, of the optic nerves. That's uh, thankfully a rare thing. Um, Thromboembolic barction can show up as a visual disturbance if it affects the visual cortex specifically and occasionally if you have a PCA uh, stroke that happens to affect that primarily, that may be the main presenting symptoms and then usual uh, neurological imaging, perfusion, diffusion, and then uh, angiography, make sure you, we know what the anatomy is of the vessels. Um, the PCAs are actually the lower vessels here, and the basal veins of Rosenthal are the ones above, and we'll track those back as they go into the, uh, into the, the branches of the PCA. Okay, so question one, which of the following is least likely in the second adult with acute vision loss? What do you think? So I said, E, because all the other ones we've seen show up as just primarily optic neuritis, but I don't think I've ever seen Wegener show up as just optic neuritis. It tends to have a lot of sinus disease, intraorbital stuff along with it. Um, which is most correct regarding this optic pathway glioma? Now, A and B are, there are associations that are important, but they are minor associations. It's only about, I think it's something like 30% of patients who have this actually have NF1, and only like 50% of patients with NF1 actually have this. So it's not most, it's some. There's an association, but it's a minor association. Um, uh, C is true, because this, is, this can often be very, very mild vision loss. You can have these really dramatic looking masses, and the vision is not that bad. Um, and enhancement does not indicate higher tumor rate, so C was the answer here. What's that? You'd point out the glioma. Oh, it's, a, it's the fact that these nerves are big and fat and juicy. Um, think about the optic nerve should be about this size here, and the interest, the cisternal and the chiasm part is all really significantly swollen. Now, because this one doesn't enhance very much, it's a little harder to, uh, uh, to identify it. Because it's bilateral. So it's and because it's bilateral, yeah. So your eyes are looking for asymmetry, and that didn't help you here. 
Uh, what's most likely clinical feature in optic uh, uh, nerve sheath meningioma? Well, vision loss tends to be gradual and painless, and this is not associated with, um, with the uh, cafe LA spots, but it is classically seen in middle, middle aged females. Um, and usually, I, I imagine you could have radiation therapy, uh, but that's not usually a typical. Okay, pathology, uh, ocular motor and other intraorbital lesions. Um, question one, which of the following diagnoses is least likely? I do a lot of least likely questions because, again, this isn't standardized testing. They're actually really useful in radiology because a lot of what we see is you don't always have exactly one answer. It's like, I think I know one or two things that this might be, but it's definitely not this. So which of these is least likely? Pseudotumor? Graves disease, IgG4, lymphoma, or sarcoid. Amazing scan. Yeah, that's not, that's not a happy, not a happy patient to leave not at this point. <clears throat> okay. What is the best diagnosis for this lesion? Axial T2 with fat suppression. Tetragroma, lymphangioma, middle lymphatic malformation, cavernous hemangioma, type 3 vascular malformation. You could argue that there might be more than one correct answer, but depending on how you feel about terminology and, and uh, the use of certain terms, um, there's probably one better answer. Okay, uh, intraorbital pathology, inflammatory, we have pseudotumor, sarcoid, um, thyroid, eye disease, tumors, we have uh, lymphoma, lymphoproliferative, um, as well as metastases, vascular, you have both malformations and neoplasms, So we could expand on these lists quite a bit, um, but we don't want to spend too much time on just orbit. Um, idiopathic inflammation can have a number of manifestations, and that's kind of its, one of its chief hallmarks is it can have one or more of these involvements. Um, classic, the myositic form, especially the lateral, you can have a lacrimal form, the anterior form, which is especially involving the nerve and intraconal structures, the apical form, which is at the, at the fissure and the apex, aka Toulouse Hunt, and then you can just have diffuse masses all over the place. Here's an example of a myositic form, a patient who had an enlarged superior oblique, um, and the patient had a palsy that got better with steroids, <coughs> presumptive diagnosis of pseudotumor. Pseudo Judith, I think this was your patient at the VA many years ago, actually. Right? Very possible. Yeah. You've seen a couple of those over the years. Yes. yes. Um, this is an example of uh, the apical former, Toulouse Hunt. You have this enlargement of the cavernous sinus um, and mass like enhancement going into the orbital apex, and this would present with multiple painful cranial neuropathies. Um, Graves' disease we see as non-uniform but kind of symmetric involvement, and it has a very specific um, uh, involvement of muscles, especially the inferior and medial. We use the mnemonic, I'm slow, inferior and medial most likely, superior, lateral and obliques less likely. In fact, if you see isolated lateral or oblique disease, it's not going to be um, thyroid-related disease. Typical examples of thyroid eye disease with uh, symmetric involvement of the muscles in a, in a non-uniform a, a, a non fashion. You can have asymmetry, but if you have involvement of one set of muscles, you almost always have involvement of the other. Even if macroscopic, we can't see it, if you were to, to look at biopsies, there would be inflammation in the muscles on the other side. Lymphoma um, shows up with lots of infiltrative we call these plastic masses because they, they tend to get into things and kind of wrap around things, get into, uh, into everything, that, like lacrimal, intraconal, extraconal, skull base, also intracranial. Um, and orbital vascular lesions, we separate these into two broad categories, malformations and neoplasms. Malformations, we have um, the, the, the venal, venal lymphatic. These are the ones that have had a lot of different uh, names over the years. 
cystic hygroma, lymphangioma, but really, beta lymphatic malformations is a, a kind of a, 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 an overarching term we can use. Orbital cavernous hemangioma is actually a malformation, not a neoplasm. We still call them hemangiomas because that's what we've called them for decades, um, but they're really malformations. And then true AVMs, which are, which are pretty rare. Neoplasia is really more of, of, a, of a childhood um, set of diseases, the infantile hemangioma and congenital hemangiomas. We do see these hemangioparasitomas in adults, which are, are uncommon. A couple of examples of the childhood kind of diseases. This is an example of one of these fetal lymphatic malformations. The characteristic of these is multiloculations and blood fluid levels. They love to hemorrhage, they love to get big, and these multiple levels of hemorrhage is the classic appearance on MR. This is an example of, a, of an infantile hemangioma. These multispatial, intraorbital, face, they can go intracranial, big uh, infiltrative enhancing masses uh, that tend to regress as the, uh, as the child um, grows. Um, leading to adults, this is the classic cavernous hemangioma. Again, these are malformations, what we call them. I call them orbital cavernous malformations and then put hemangioma in quotes so people know what we're talking about. If you're communicating with somebody who wants to call this a hemangioma, we have to know that that's, that's what we're going to term it, but it really is a malformation. And then AVMs of the orbit are really quite rare. Okay, so which is the least likely? Well, it involves the nerve, it involves the muscle, but there's also intracranial disease, supercellular, and even the third nerve has some disease along. So when you have this kind of multifocal infiltrative process, it's going to be either lymphoma or it's going to be inflammatory granulomas. So, um, pseudotumor, you bet. Um, IgG4, yep. Lymphoma, for sure. Sarcoid, yes. This would be a great picture for any of those. This happens to be sarcoid. The one thing it's not going to be is thyroid eye disease because it really doesn't have the pattern of muscle involvement. And this kind of nerve and intracranial involvement will not be seen. Keep track of the time here. I'm a little late. Um, what is the best diagnosis? Well, really, the best name for this is venal lymphatic malformation. Um, cystic hygroma is an old-fashioned term. Lymphangioma, also old-fashioned. Oma implies neoplasm, and so we don't like to use those terms uh, if we're trying to be really pathologically um, accurate. So, uh, venal lymphatic malformation is the best term. Cavernous hemangioma, those are the adult circumscribed, really discrete lesions, the ones that, um, that uh, surgeons love to operate because they, apparently they just come right out and make you feel good. Um, Type 3 vascular malformation, that would be an AVM, uh, and that wouldn't be this. Um, skull based in intracranial pathology. Um, I think in the interest of time, I'm just going to, we'll, we'll go over these um, quickly at the end. But I will ask you number six. Which of the following is least likely in this patient with multiple cranial neuropathies? And this is a T1 post-contrast non-fat set of the brain showing all this enhancement in the, uh, in the basal cisterns. West Nile, cryptococcus, sarcoid lymphoma, tuberculosis, which is least likely. Um, so we already talked about pituitary adenoma with regard to visual pathways. Um, and meningioma as well, METs, either in the skull base or lipomeningeal, and schwannoma, which is interesting but somewhat rare. So in addition to going straight up like these pituitary macroadenomas tend to do, here you can see it, a little bit of mass effect on the optic chism. If they go sideways into the cavernous sinus, they can invade and affect the cranial nerves there, but that's relatively less common than the typical supercellular extension. Here's an example of a cavernous sinus, uh, uh, sort of a um, typical location for a meningioma. Here we see thickening of the dura and enhancement. This looks an awful lot like that case of Toulouse Hunt, doesn't it? Um, the difference is this is not going to be multiple painful cranial neuropathies. This is going to be chronic painless cranial neuropathies. This is a classic location. This is a really fairly common location for a central skull base meningioma. Notice also that the uh, medial rectus is out. Um, when you have diffuse left meningeal disease, you can get, of course, a lot of other neurological symptoms, but cranial neuropathies is one of the things that you will see because they tend to be um, exposed and, and uh, react poorly to the infiltration of anything. In this case, it happens to be a 
primary uh, <coughs> uh, 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 PXA, but anything that is that is diffusely um, spread throughout the CSF can give you multiple uh, cranial neuropathies. Uh, schwannoma is a somewhat rare condition, but it's interesting, and we see them occasionally. They can be isolated on three, four, or six. They uh, can be associated with neurofibromatosis, and they show up as a nodular mass right in the cistern along the course of where we know the nerve lives. Here's an example of a patient who has a superior oblique that's out on one side, and if you look at the imaging, there's just this little nodule right there. Now, it's going to be hard to see the fourth nerve normally, but that's exactly where the nerve lives, uh, and we know that this patient has a, a superior oblique that's out, so this is a presumed schwannoma of the fourth nerve. You're never going to operate on this because you, you're not going to make anything any better, but that would be a pretty, I think, a confident diagnosis to make. Vascular lesions that can affect um, the central skull base, um, venous thrombosis, and then carotid fistula and aneurysm. Um, so, uh, cavernous sinus thrombosis is usually seen in association with either something inflammatory like sinusitis or osteomyelitis, but also um, you can't see it in, in malignancy that's invading the central skull base. Here's a patient who has chronic sphenotinusitis, and the fact that the bone is so reactive tells us that it's been that way for a long time. But at some point, they got an acute secondary infection or, or super infection. They got into the cavernous sinuses. And notice how the sinuses are widened. It's a little easier to see that on MR. Um, multiple neuropathies. It leading for an enlarged cavernous sinus, non-enhancing clot in the cavernous sinus, and usually the, the superior ophthalmic vein of uh, the orbit is enlarged. So here we see a T2 on the left. This big, fat cavernous sinus is just chock full of stuff. On the post contrast, usually the cavernous sinus just lights up because it's full of gadolinium. Here we have all this thrombus in here that is widening the cavernous sinus, but it's not enhancing because that's clot. And that's, a, and that's kind, of a, kind of a devastating thing to have to deal with. Internal carotid lesions um, in the skull base. You'll often see flow effects. For example, here is an aneurysm of the carotid that's, that's going into the cavernous sinus. You can imagine the compressing nerves there. Look for either the flow void. Or on some sequences, like contrast, there is, uh, if, if, you've, if you've seen what flow looks like on MR, there is a, rever a kind of, a, it looks like a reverberation of signal along one direction, what we call the phase encoding direction. But if you see these little echoes of flow along one direction, that is what we call a, a phase ghost or flow artifact. Um, aneurysms can thrombose. There's a giant aneurysm of the terminal ICA. In this case, it's mostly full of thrombus. And you would need the CTA to find out um, what, the, what possibly where the neck of this thing is um, in relationship to the vessel. And then CC fistula, in this case, uh, the example I showed you, just really briefly. Um, angiography is something that is, is, is getting less and less common um, for us mere mortals to know about. I did angiography when I was a, a fellow, but I don't do angiography anymore. And, and it's starting to get to be something that um, is now just for. Um, uh, only uh, the neurointerventionalist to do. But it's good to know uh, uh, what the images look like. This is a lateral angiogram, carotid injection. All this contrast here is in the cavernous sinus. It shouldn't be there. This is an early arterial phase, um, so you should only be filling out the arteries. You are filling out the branches of the MCA, but you're also filling the cavernous sinus, the superior ophthalmic vein, and you're also filling this vein right here, the, the um, petrosal sinus, which, so all these vein structures should not be filling in the early arterial injection, which tells you you have a, a fistula of uh, the carotid, um, which is least likely. Well, this is, a, this is a picture of leptomeningeal disease. It's either carcinomatosis or it's leptomeningeal infection. Um, fungal infection, uh, sure. Sarcoid, yep. Any granulomas disease, lymphoma, TB. When you think of lymphoma or you think of granulomatous, those two have a lot of overlap. So granulomatous disease, sarcoid, lymphoma, or TB, um, fungal. When you say one, include the other because they have a lot of, of imaging overlap. But West Nile is, is actually an encephalitis. It's not going to show up with leptomeningeal disease. OK, we just have time to do some pupillary pathology. Question one, uh, what is the most common location <coughs> for aneurysm that causes pupillary dysfunction? This is your circle of Willis, kind of schematically splayed out. 
Question two, what type, what subtype of neuronal injury is most likely in this trauma patient with Horner syndrome? First order preganglionic, second order preganglionic, second order postganglionic, third order postganglionic. And bonus points if you identify the ridiculous answer in this. Okay, so um, parasympathetic innervation um, comes from an injury westfall in the midbrain. It courses very closely with the third nerve. You can kind of think of it in the same location. Um, compressive lesions uh, have to do with the relative location of where the somatic versus autonomic fibers are in the nerve. So is the pupil involved? Well, it's sphincter uh, function that's impaired, and you get this when you have extrinsic compression, and that's because the uh, motor fibers Somatic fiber is central, but the parasympathetic fiber is on the outside. So if you have an extrinsic compression, it's going to get uh, the pupil first. So we think of the classic lesion as being a saccular aneurysm at the PCOM origin. Uh, a vascular loop can do the same thing. So here is a classic PCOM aneurysm. This is the carotid artery coming up. And this is a big aneurysm coming off the back of the carotid at the PCOM. We call it a PCOM aneurysm, but technically it's an internal carotid aneurysm at the origin of the PCOM. And this is right where... Uh, uh, the the uh, PCOM takes off. It's in close proximity to where that nerve runs, and that's why it gets gets tagged. Here's an example of a, a branch. Here you can see um, the third nerve, and it's being compressed by this uh, branch of, of the anterior cerebral, let's say A1, and it's pushing it and giving the patient a neuropathy of the third nerve. Uh, sympathetic, um, preganglionic, so the pathway starts from the hypothalamus down to the spine to the superior cervical ganglion. So it starts in the hypothalamus down to the ciliospinal, comes out, and then has its synapsis in the superior cervical ganglion. Now, to get the terminology straight, it helps to know which ganglion. And there's this took me forever when I was when I was learning this to remember. But the stellate ganglion is not the ganglion we're talking about. That one's down low at the at the apex of the of the chest. The ganglion that we're talking about is the superior cervical ganglion. So we, when we say preganglionic plus ganglionic, we're talking about the superior cervical ganglion, not the, uh... is it time out? Um, or maybe I lost this. I lost the screen. I can, I, okay, I can look up here. Okay. So we have the first order nerves down to the, the spinal cord and the second order nerves up to the superior cervical ganglion. Those are the first and second order preganglionic fibers. The postganglionic are those after the superior cervical ganglion. So lesions that give you preganglionic are going to be in the brain and spinal cord, although a brain and spinal cord lesion is rarely going to pick off just these fibers. So you're going to have more than just a Horner's. You're going to have a bunch of other stuff too, especially if it's, if it's intracranial or spinal cord. You're going to know you have a brain lesion or a spinal cord lesion. You're not going to have an isolated Horner's. But if you have something that is in the brachial plexus or paraspinous mediastinum, um, it, could make, it could be in a position to pick off those autonomic nerves and give you a, a Horner's without a whole lot of other things. Classic um, lung apex, the pancreas tumor affecting um, the brachial plexus. You would, of course, expect to see some brachial plexus symptoms as well, but to be more localized. So here's an example of lymphoma involving uh, the, the spinal column. There's an, an, intra, an intraspinal component, so you wouldn't be surprised to have some spinal core symptoms as well, but here we see it affecting um, the, uh, the area of the brachial plexus and, of course, those um, second-order preganglionic nerves. Um, postganglionic, this is from the superior cervical ganglion, and it follows the carotid plexus. These are the third-order neurons um, through the skull base, and it kind of follows into the orbit right along with where V2 runs, where uh, V1 runs. So here's your preganglionic fibers, and then beyond that, the postganglionic, they follow the carotid all the way up into the skull base and then in, uh, through the, the the fissure into the orbit. Lesions of these are going to be like classically uh, associated with a carotid dissection, arteriopathies like FMD, um, masses that affect um, uh, uh, the artery, uh, like glomus tumors. Here's an example of, of FMD. Uh, you can see all this very irregular beating of the carotid artery in the, in the distal cervical segment, the classical location for it. Here's a patient with a long segment dissection of the carotid artery, petrous cavernous segments. 
and uh, again, you, how we use these T1 pre-contrast images to look for subintimal hematoma as a sign of dissection compared to the, the normal artery right there. Okay, so what's the most common location for aneurysm that causes pupillary dysfunction? B, right? PECOM. And the reason why the B is here and not here is because, again, the origin of the aneurysm is usually at the carotid where the, the, the takeoff of the PECOM is. So here we have a trauma patient and they have a fracture right where we know that those second order nerves are coming out. So this is going to be, uh, at least this lesion is going to be causing a second order preganglionic. This was, the, this was the silly answer because there is no such thing as second order postganglionic. Okay, that's all we have. Any questions? That's awesome. Great. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you